Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, for our webinar this afternoon. My name is Louise Turner and I am the Membership Development Manager here at Silex. So today we're going to be talking all about becoming a Silex practitioner. And we are joined today by my colleague from Silex Regulation, Danielle Ingle, who is their practitioner team leader. So Danielle is going to take you through step by step exactly um, how you can apply to become an independent, um, how you can apply for your independent practice rights to become a Silex practitioner. Um, you'll have an opportunity to ask her questions um, and you can do that by using the Q&A box. If we just spend a few moments now just exploring um, the Q&A box so you know where it is and how you questions. So if you hover your mouse over the centre of the screen slightly towards the bottom, a toolbar will come up and in that toolbar there is um, an icon which has two uh, speech bubbles on it, one with the question mark in it. If you click on there um, you'll see the Q&A box um, populate towards the right hand side of your screen and that's where you can type in your questions to Danielle. Um, we're going to keep an eye on that question box um, and as at times that we feel appropriate we'll try and um, put the questions to Danielle and she'll do her very best to answer them. Um, if we receive a lot of questions and we simply can't get through them all during the webinar, we will save them up to the end and we'll make sure that we circulate the Q&A uh, with the slides uh, from today's webinar um, as soon as we can afterwards. We'll also record today's webinar, so um, if at any point um, you miss a bit or you want to watch it over again, don't worry, you'll be able to find it in about a week's time in um, my career in the my silex development box and you can access my career um, via your my silex account so i think that's all the housekeeping done um, and all that remains is for me to introduce you to danielle ingle so welcome danielle thanks louise hello everyone so my name's danielle as louise said i'm the practitioner team leader at silex regulation uh, which means that I head up the team that's responsible for applications for individuals becoming authorised persons. So that includes chartered legal executive status, uh, but also the independent practice rights applications. So if we move on to the first slide, then we're looking at what independent practice rights are. So becoming a silex practitioner means that you can pr practice without supervision in the areas of practice that would be considered as reserved legal activities or a regulated legal activity so there are essentially some activities that ordinarily a member of silex would need to be supervised to work within because as a member of silex you're not necessarily an authorized person unless you're at a certain level also within that if you're thinking about setting up your own firm you would need to be an authorized person in certain areas depending on the types of services that you're wanting to deliver so as i've said on the slide it might be the first step towards owning your uh, your own authorized law firm but also it can be um, just an employability move to make yourself more qualified in the area that you're working in uh, and if we move on to the next slide, we're going to look at the areas that this covers. So as this slide shows, you've got uh, conveyancing, probate, immigration and then litigation and advocacy for civil, criminal and family proceedings. So with conveyancing and probate, obviously lots of members are working in these um, areas of practice and where your work might be supervised by a solicitor with these practice rights you can get the ability to do that work yourself so it opens up those positions um, like heads of department or maybe even partnership might be more possible more achievable if you are a silex practitioner um, whether you're a chartered legal executive already or not um, so if we move on to the next slide we will be looking at um, who can apply so the reason I mentioned probate and conveyancing in the last bit was because for probate and conveyancing practice rights, you don't need to be any particular level of Silex membership to make an application. 
So what that means is if you're an associate member or even a student um, or even not a member of Silex, you can come to Silex regulation and apply to be authorised as a Silex probate practitioner or a Silex conveyancing practitioner. If you're wanting rights for litigation or immigration, so to become a Silex litigator and advocate or a Silex immigration practitioner, you need to be at graduate membership level, ideally, as a minimum, um, and you can't be authorised as a practitioner in those areas until you've been admitted as a chartered legal executive. So whilst the handbooks for those schemes would say that people in the lower grades of membership could make an application, it's not really advised. We would advise that you're at least graduate membership level so that you know that you're on that path to becoming a chartered legal executive. Otherwise, you're doing the application and you can't be authorised um, on completion of the application. So it's just causing delays that you, you wouldn't want. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, the application requirements then. So as we've explained, who can who can think about applying? We then look about eligibility. So applicants need to have at least five years legal sector experience. That doesn't have to be at FIERNA or practitioner level. You don't need to be a qualified lawyer for, for some of the applications, as we said. But you do need to have at least two years immediately before you make the application working in the area that you're making the application for at a level where you're running files in your own name. The reason for this is obviously that on completion of the application, you would be able to work in this area unsupervised. So you need to be able to show that you can run the process from start to finish. You're aware of the problems that you might incur and you're ready to take that next step. If you're still in the early stages of your career, um, maybe in terms of seniority, then just wait a little longer is the best advice. You need to have two years experience of really knowing your stuff, being really experienced, running files, having your own caseload, ideally, um, to be ready for this. The application is looking that you can demonstrate that you have the necessary knowledge and understanding, experience and skills. And all of this is outlined in the relevant handbook and scheme rules. So on the Silex regulation website, you will see that there are uh, the different handbooks for the different applications. So there are six handbooks to recognise the six areas that we provide rights in, um, and they are bespoke relevant to the application that you're making. This presentation today is going to be a bit more general because I'm trying to cover all six in one, um, but I will do my best to talk through each um, individual requirement as I can with the time allowing. So if we move through to the next slide. As I said before, we've got to look at your knowledge, experience and skills when deeming whether you're ready for becoming an independent practitioner. So if we start with the knowledge requirements, then we have three ways of demonstrating this. If we move to the next slide, we'll look at option one. So option one is meeting the knowledge requirement through completion of the Silex level six examinations. So if you're a graduate member or a chartered legal executive, you're likely to have covered um, the area of law and practice in your specialist area, and that's likely to then be the area that you're seeking practice rights in. So you may find that the knowledge requirements are quite easy to be met in that sense. So as you can see from this slide in the table, you've got the, the law paper and the practice paper listed there. So for conveyancing, we'd be looking at someone having completed successfully the land law and conveyancing papers. For probate, that's wills and succession and probate practice. For civil litigation, you're looking at contract law and or tort with civil litigation. For criminal litigation, we're looking at criminal law and criminal litigation. And for family litigation rights, you need to have family law and family practice. Now, you may notice that immigration isn't included in that table, and that's because for option one, unfortunately, you can't use um, 
you can't use it for immigration. There's no equivalent level six practice paper to match with immigration law if you did study it at level six. So unfortunately, you wouldn't be able to rely on a matched law and practice paper for that application. If you have completed these papers as listed in the table for the relevant application, then all you need to do in the application form is choose option one for knowledge and provide us with the dates that you pass the exam. We will then just check that against the Silex exam records to check everything's all in order um, and nothing further would be required for knowledge in that situation. So if we move through to option two, so this is equivalent examinations. So this is where you might have passed um, a law degree or you may have done alternative examinations to the Silex ones in your route to becoming a Chartered Legal Executive, like an LPC or a bar training course. Um, and where an equivalent level six subject has been studied, we can look to map those requirements, uh, sorry, those, those qualifications against the requirements of the application. It's worth noting, if you did complete something like an LPC or a bar training course before becoming a member of Silex and you received exemptions from Silex when joining from level six units, you can rely on those exemptions again. What we would ask you to do is provide confirmation of that. I and mean, again, we can check that against the Silex examination records and the exemption reports, um, but really, we will still need to see the certificate of your course and the transcript of marks to show that you pass the relevant examinations. Obviously, with certain subjects where you've done, uh, say, a law degree and then joined uh, Silex and completed the graduate fast track and you're now seeking to make a probate application, it's unlikely that you will have covered wills in your law degree. So this wouldn't cover the matched law and practice that you would require and you may be thinking about option three which we will come to in a situation where you're applying for conveyancing rights however if you've covered land law in your degree and then you've studied conveyancing at level six with silex as part of the graduate fast track you'd be looking at a mixture of option one and option two to cover law and practice so there are ways around if you haven't got the match law and practice all with Silex or all with um, an alternative awarding body. Uh, in those situations, it's best to ask the question. You can use a Q&A box and we can get back to you later um, or, you know, make the application and, and we can advise you the next steps once we've got it. So as I've, as I've got on the slide here, uh, you need to provide the following um, name of the awarding body, the title of the exam that you've done, the date that you passed the exam, evidence of your results, so that's your certificate, your transcript of marks, and in some situations we will need a syllabus. So where Silex hasn't mapped the exam um, and it's not a listed exemption for Silex, we probably will need to use the syllabus to map against the requirements for knowledge. So if we move through to option three then, this is portfolios. So if, you, if you're sat watching this and you're thinking, well, option one and option two don't apply because I covered my Silex exams in an area that I'm not now working in, or um, I just don't have the, the relevant qualifications at that level. If you're, if you're not a, a graduate member or a Chartered Legal Executive, that may be possible. Option three is going to apply. So that's portfolios that demonstrate your knowledge of the relevant subjects through work that you've completed in practice. Now, what you do for this is you pick five cases that you've handled in the last two years to demonstrate the knowledge that you've gained through working in practice. As mentioned before, in the situation where you've got, say, one level six paper or the, an equivalent level six, but you haven't got, say, wills as the law paper, you would need to choose option three portfolios and you would draft your portfolios generally around the subject where you haven't got the exam. That being said, it's still worth using these portfolios away as a way of demonstrating your knowledge of both the law and practice area, even if you have done an examination in one of them. The reason for that will be explained slightly later on, um, but it is worthwhile doing that. In the handbook of your um, relevant scheme, 
you will find the competence frameworks for the knowledge, experience and skills requirements at Annex 3. This is a three columned table and it will give you the relevant outcomes that you need to meet, um, the learning element and what we call the supporting experience points. So if you are having to do portfolios for knowledge, it's really worth taking the time to understand what those outcomes are focusing on and what the supporting experience points are leading to so that you can identify five cases that really get a good spread of those criteria. Reason I say that is because when those are then assessed, we're looking to meet, see that 50% of those competence framework criteria have been met. So that's knowledge. Um, and if we move through to the next slide, we move on to experience. So when we're looking at the next criteria for the application of experience, as we've mentioned before, you needed to have five years legal experience as a minimum. And with that, we ask that you provide details of your work history over the last five years as well. So we ask you to provide your details of your employment, your position. Um, we ask you some questions about the types of cases you've handled, the amount of time that you spend in the area that you're looking to apply for rights in, because sometimes we appreciate you're not always doing solely conveyancing or solely criminal work. You might be spending your time across some different disciplines. So we just want to see that you've got enough exposure to the types of types of issues. Um, we also ask about niche parts of your caseload. And if you don't have any, that's absolutely fine. But if you do, this is the opportunity to sell yourself on, on your exposure to some more unusual things. And we just basically ask you to write a personal statement discussing what you've done over the last five years um, as part of the knowledge assessment. The other thing that we ask you to do is provide three cases, um, three portfolios demonstrating cases that you've handled in practice. Now, if you've covered option three for knowledge and you've provided five portfolios, you won't need to do any more portfolios for experience. We'll ask our external assessors to assess your experience from the knowledge portfolios. But where you're relying on Silex exams or equivalent examinations, we will need you to provide three portfolios of the area where you've handled the cases. So if you're doing conveyancing and you've done level six land law and conveyancing, you would need to provide three cases from the last two years just to show your experience of handling them. With a litigation advocacy application, as you can see, you're getting rights in two areas. So the main practice right is obviously in relation to litigation, um, but it also gives you the rights of audience to be able to go into court in the relevant types of proceedings. So for experience, you do have to do a little bit more. Um, and all that is, is completing the questions at Annex 4 for the relevant area. You'll see on the form if this relates to you. Some of the questions posed are for civil and family applicants and others are for criminal applicants. Obviously, just answer the ones that are relevant to the application you're making. And in addition to that, you need to provide another three cases where you're um, either conducting advocacy or providing advice at the police station. And as on the slide says, you've got uh, a portfolio template specifically for advocacy cases at Annex 5 of the application form. And for police station advice cases, you can use Annex 6. So for your um, in, in, in that scenario, just to be completely clear, you would do three litigation cases using Annex 2. You'd answer the questions at Annex 4 and then you'd either provide three advocacy cases using Annex 5 or three police station advice cases using Annex 6. If you're not applying for litigation and advocacy rights, you're simply providing three cases for either conveyancing, probate or immigration using Annex 2. So I hope that helps with experience. If we move to the next slide, I thought it might be worth just going through some tips for what you might want to do with your portfolio. So as we've mentioned, it's only three cases generally, and obviously with the advocacy, it's slightly more involved. But if we just focus on those three main area cases, choose a range. 
if you're doing conveyancing, maybe choose a sale, a purchase, a lease. If you're doing probate, maybe use something in testacy, a uh, straightforward will, maybe a provision for um, inheritance. Uh, for immigration, you might want to use different types of application, um, maybe something relating to family, um, you know, dependents, just so that you can show your exposure to the different types of, of the law that you're applying for. The next point is just using plain English and explaining the law fully. So don't try and make these overly complicated. I know it, it becomes tempting to try and really show off your skills, um, but it's not an exam. So it's really best to remain concise, but explain the points as you would to a lay person. So whilst these portfolios are marked by an external advisor who's, who's a specialist in the area that you're applying for the rights, Assume that they don't know as much as they do, but don't labour points either. Cite the law, explain what it means, apply it to the facts and then move on. That sort of approach. My third point on this slide is issues does not always mean problems. So you'll notice when you get to look at the form that the annex templates tend to focus on funding issues, evidential issues, ethical issues. And a lot of applicants in the first instance think what went wrong with it? What was the problem with it? But that's not what we're trying to get at. I would rephrase issues of things to consider. So instead of thinking about where did it cause you a problem? Instead, focusing focusing on what you had to think about. So with ethical issues, a lot of applicants they don't see that there were any ethical issues, possibly because there weren't, but there were things that they had to think about to ensure that there weren't ethical issues that prevented them from being able to act. And again, with evidential issues, a lot of applicants, because this form covers the litigation subjects as well as the, the slightly um, more procedural areas of law, evidence is always in a matter. It just might not be um, a witness statement. If you're doing probate, you're going to look at the value of the estate. You're going to look at gifts that the uh, the deceased gave. They're still evidence looking to see if there's receipts, estate accounts, that type of thing. And again, for conveyancing, you've got things like search results, um, mortgage reports, anything that, you know, responses from the sellers, uh, lawyers that, that you might need to review. You can see those as evidence just as much as, you know, the litigation subjects will feel more comfortable with knowing what that is. The next point is be reflective. The reason why I've mentioned this and it ties in with the last point about future training needs is that a lot of applicants, obviously you're very experienced lawyers if you're thinking about taking up practice rights anyway. And so when it comes to the portfolio template and it starts to think about what training needs arise from this case. It can be very tempting to say, well, there weren't any. And whilst we understand that, because in the individual situation, that may be the case, it's best to reflect back and say why that's the case. What have you done in the past that prepared you for this? What will you plan to do in the future, potentially through your CPD requirements, to keep you up to date and competent? Because as an independent practitioner, whilst you're then higher qualified than you were, it's not the final step. And there is a requirement to, you know, maintain your CPD requirements, keep up to date, make sure that you're the best lawyer that you can be. And this portfolio is just that as well. You need to be able to show that you're always thinking about ways to improve. So if we move on to the next slide, we're looking at skills. So as we mentioned at the beginning, obviously it's knowledge, experience and skills. So this is the final sort of assessment criteria, if you like, for the application. And for each application, we're looking at client care, legal research and practice skills relevant to the area that you're working in. So the, the practice skills will vary depending on the area that you're applying for. Some things are more relevant to certain areas of law. Um, worth mentioning that like with uh, knowledge, as we mentioned earlier, 
The client care and legal research units at level six can be used as exemptions from those outcomes. So if you have those, you won't need to do outcome um, logbooks for client care and legal research. Equally, if you've done an LPC or a bar training course, we can look to map those against the client care and legal research skills just in the same way uh, that you don't have to do them when you're joining Silex. But with the practice skills, nine times out of 10, people need to build a logbook uh, using work from their caseload, redacted evidence um, to show how they've demonstrated these skills in practice. So if we move on to the next slide, we're looking at how to build the skills logbook. So essentially, you have a logbook sheet discussing the outcome and that's supported by evidence from your caseload to show that skill being used in practice. Now for each area of the applications, as far as my memory serves, you have to provide an example of interviewing. So some people do use courses that they've covered in the past on interviewing, like the legal practice course, some people will use the training that they covered there on interviewing and see if that maps appropriately. But the best solution is to use actual evidence of showing that you've done it. Um, essentially, you have a logbook sheet and the template for this is at Annex 3 of the application form. And again, as I mentioned before, in Annex 3 of the scheme handbook, you've got the three columns. The first column covers the skills element and you will often find there's about four or five skills elements, depending on the application you're making. Within those elements, there may be two or three outcomes. And for each outcome in the third column of that table at Annex 3, you'll find the supporting experience points. So with the logbook sheet, you're discussing how the outcome um, is being met and demonstrated through the evidence that you're submitting. The supporting experience points at Annex 3 should guide what evidence you choose. So it might be that for interviewing, you've got things like greet the interviewee appropriately. That isn't going to be easily evidenced physically, but you can talk about that in your logbook sheet. Whereas when you get further down the outcomes and you get to something like drafting and you've been asked to show drafting of a transfer or a lease, you should be able to provide documentary evidence for that type of thing. So my advice would be with your logbook sheet, make them relatively detailed, but keep it concise. So don't overburden the assessor with lots of um, lots of information. But at the same time, it's that case of giving them enough that you don't assume that they know, but not providing more in peace either. Now, with your logbook sheet and the supporting experience points, some applicants have started to choose using the supporting experience points as subheadings in the logbook sheet and then providing evidence where they can and talking about the evidence relevant to the supporting experience point that they um, are, are discussing. It's worth mentioning that all evidence needs to be redacted. We cannot see any confidential or sensitive third party information. Um, so just make sure that that, that um, is all done before it's submitted to us. And the other bit of advice would be that you choose a range of matters to get your evidence from. Again, it just shows the breadth of your skills. So if we move through to the next slide. So we've discussed knowledge, experience and skills and on successful completion of those, you would be deemed to be competent to be a Silex practitioner. The practice management and accounts section of the application form, which is part five, is not mandatory for all applicants. So I've kept this slide quite brief. Um, in that you complete this part of the form if you intend to practice through an entity that will be or is already regulated by Silex regulation. So essentially, if you are planning on setting up your own firm, 
this might be relevant to you but you may find that you do it at a later stage when you're making your application for entity regulation equally if you're working in a firm that's regulated by silex then you will need to be assessed to level one standard to act as a practitioner in that firm any questions that you have about practice management and accounts i'll need to refer to my colleague so instead of using the Q&A box, you may want to email us and I do have the email address later in the slides for that, but it is practice rights at silexregulation.org.uk. And my apologies for not, not providing too much information on this. It's just not something that I'm so familiar with. Um, but you're looking again to show your knowledge, understanding, experience and skills against a number of different outcomes that relate to practice management and accounts. Um, so again, this is it's for entity regulation applicants and also people that want to work in Silex regulated firms. So if we move through to the next slide. So once you've compiled all of that information, whether it's knowledge, experience, skills, and practice management and accounts, you're going to be sending it into us. So I thought it might be ready, uh, wise to get you ready for what what that process looks like. So when we receive applications in Silex regulation, they're initially reviewed internally and generally by myself. We'll look at whether things have been laid out correctly, presentation wise, if it if it follows well. Um, it's not a content assessment, it's more presentation and layout, checking that everything is there as it should be. Um, you'd be surprised that the odd outcome gets missed. So sometimes it's just worth going back and saying, you know, send us your logbook sheets for this. Um, the initial assessment works quite well in that way. It also gives us an opportunity to do the admin side of the application. Uh, as mentioned later in the slide, we've got um, your referees are contacted and we discuss the standard DBS check requirements with you. Um, and once we're satisfied with the initial assessment and if there's feedback, we, we've obviously provided it to you and you've, you've sent in what we've asked for, then we would look to send off your portfolios and skills logbook to our external assessor. And again, this is an assessment process. It's not like a formal exam, um, although it's obviously marked like an exam and, and you need to meet the pass standard. Um, it's not pass or fail on, on first go. So if there are things where you've met certain outcomes and you've not met others, we can give you feedback specifically on the ones that need to be readdressed. Um, if there's reworking needed, if there's questions about your experience and whether you know the assessor might want a fourth experience case covering a specific type of thing um, all of that process will will continue and that's why where lots of applicants will say how long does an application take to process it really can depend uh, it depends on your timing and your availability as an applicant the availability of our assessors, um, obviously the quality of the assessment the first time round, how many times it needs to be resubmitted, um, but it really can range. So it's, it's difficult for us to give you any more than than our time scales, which is that the first review, the one by me, is usually completed within sort of 15 working days of receipt of the application. And the external assessments we try to get done within four weeks of sending to the assessor. Often it can be quite a bit quicker, but because these are external assessors, we have to you know, allow for the fact that they have other work commitments and priorities as well. So looking at the third and fourth points on this slide, um, just to give you a bit more detail on that, your referees are contacted. So um, in the application form, we ask you to provide details of two legally authorised persons to act as referees for your application. So these tend to be your employer or a former employer, um, but provided the person is an authorised person, preferably in the area that you're seeking the rights, and they have knowledge of your work and your integrity, your ability to understand issues, they can provide a reference for you if they're happy to. These are professional references, but they don't need to come from your employer. Um, 
they can come from people that you've you've worked alongside in the past or someone that you instruct um, really anyone but if you have any questions about who might be a suitable referee feel free to pop them in the q a and, and we can we can hopefully answer those for you in terms of the standard dbs check this relates to um, character and suitability requirements for becoming an authorised person or becoming an authorised person in an additional area if you're already a chartered legal executive. Um, so a standard DBS check is slightly higher in terms of what it shows than a basic DBS check and it's not something that you can apply for yourself. So what we say is don't worry about it. Um, you don't need to do anything in advance of making the application. We will need to ask you to pay an additional fee to the cheque provider. I believe it's currently £33.40 and the provider that we use are called UCheck. So when we receive your application and as part of the initial assessment, we'll contact you um, and we will provide you with a link to the UCheck portal where you can set up your application. We ask you to send in three forms of certified identification documents and that's so that we can verify the check and get it submitted. Once the check's complete, the DBS service will send it through to you at home um, and we ask for you to send us a scan of the front and back of the certificate. Um, this is then kept on file. Um, if anything does show on the certificate or if you have any prior conduct, then this will need to be considered by the enforcement team and potentially the professional conduct panel. Um, obviously, if that relates to you, you might want to email us separately if you're thinking about making an application. Um, we can tend to do those checks um, before we receive the bulk of the information so that you know whether it's likely to be um, allowed or not. So that's how's the application process. So if we move through to the next slide, we're looking at how do you apply? So at the moment, obviously due to COVID-19, we're, work we're working remotely um, and we don't have access to the post frequently enough to say that we can accept postal submissions. So at the moment, we are asking that applications are sent in by email and that's to practice rights at silexregulation.org.uk. When you're ready, you'll be sending us your completed application form, any relevant knowledge or experience portfolios and your skills logbook. That's obviously quite a lot of documentation, so you may end up sending us a few emails attaching those documents, or if you want to, you can send it to us using um, WeTransfer, uh, but if you are choosing to use that service, then please do let us know by email that you're doing that because we need to check the, the um, validity of the link before we, we start clicking on it. On receipt of your application and all the relevant information, we'll send you an invoice for the £450 application fee. Uh, at the moment, obviously, uh, payment is preferred by back transfer. We can take payment over the telephone with a credit or debit card and we're not currently accepting checks. So that's how, in, how do you apply. So if we move through, supporting guidance. So hopefully what we've just discussed will outline in brief terms what the handbook says in quite a lot of detail. Uh, it's really important that you find the relevant handbook, familiarise yourself with the application requirements and really focus on that Annex 3 competency framework. The rules are also a useful tool, obviously, uh, and they everything can be found on the Silex Regulation website in the resource library under I am an applicant. Obviously, if you have any questions, you can email us at that practice rights at silexregulation.org.uk email address uh, and either myself or, or someone in my team will pick that up. If you want to arrange a call, we can do that. Obviously, working remotely, we've not got the same access to the phones as we used to, so it's, it's easier to arrange a time to speak um, and we can put some time in, contextualise it all to your own situation what your exams are, what your work history is, um, and, and really get you comfortable with what the requirements are. So if we move on, 
I thought a nice way to end this part of the, the, the webinar, it would just be to see some feedback from some people who've been through the process. Uh, Kirsty Claridge, as you can see, she really recently became a Silex probate practitioner and she's mentioned that having the extra time at home meant it was the extra push to get on with things and that actually what seemed daunting wasn't so hard and um, actually relatively straightforward is, is what she said there. So that's really um, encouraging. I thought it was a good um, quote to use in terms of if you're having doubts about the inputs that, that's needed, if you do it at the start, it's really it's really beneficial. It pays off in the end. Kirsty had a really good assessment um, and yeah, really positive result. And another um, conveyancing practitioner, Sean Turvey, uh, she highly recommends it. Uh, as you can see, it's a fantastic feeling when you receive your practicing certificate for the first time. It puts us on an equal footing with other legal practitioners as we should be. It is a very proud moment indeed. So, you know, if you're thinking this might be for me, it sounds really good and you want that pro proud moment feeling, make an application. So I think that's it from uh, me for this side of things. But Louise, if we've got any time for questions. Yeah, we certainly have. Um, there's been a lot of questions come through. The first one, which I have sort of answered, Danielle, based on what you've said during the webinar, but I think perhaps we could go a little further. So the first question is, um, I'm in immigration practice as a fellow of Silex and have been for seven years. I wish to become an independent practitioner and set up my own practice. How do I set up quickly? Now, I know you said that it takes 15 working days for the initial review of the application, which you would normally conduct yourself, and then four weeks uh, when your application is passed to an external assessor. But is there any more time after that? So if they pass, then then how long does it take for them to be authorised by Silex regulations? So sort of the end to end timeline, I think, would be helpful to know. Yeah, so. In terms of end to end, as, as you've mentioned that process there, Louise, um, on completion of the external assessment and once you've got that competent mark against the knowledge, experience and skills criteria, it's really very quick. Um, with the initial assessment, we do try and do all of that DBS and reference requests right at the start so that they can just come in um, in the background whilst the assessment's taking place so that hopefully that final um, yes from the external assessor is the tick in the box and the authorisation can be done very quickly from there. Um, we did recently have an application that went through in under four weeks. So when I say, you know, the first assessment can take up to 15 working days, unfortunately, that's just resource. You know, I have to do a lot of it myself um, and I manage a team and, you know, as much as the applications are really important, um, sometimes we just can't do them as quickly as others. So we try our best, but if we can do it quicker than 15 working days for that initial review, so you know that you're on the right track, we certainly will. OK, um, thank you. So um, the next question I just wanted to touch on um, is that a member has asked whether there is anyone who could guide them through the process as a mentor. Now, I know that mentoring um, and a mentoring programme is something that is hopefully on the horizon for us to be able to offer to Silex members um, overall. Um, but I don't know if there are any um, practitioners that you know of who've been through the process who who perhaps might uh, be able to offer any other insights to members considering it. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it it makes sense for it to be the area of practice that you're you're making the application for for the practitioner that you would speak to. Um, but a lot of the practitioners that have who've been through the process and especially the ones that have then gone on to have firms regulated by Silex are really supportive um, they really encourage people to come through the scheme. You know, they're, they're kind of the trailblazers. It's been around for a while. There's about 65 practitioners. So, you know, there's there's a good pool to choose from. Um, and I certainly, you know, if you want to send an, an email through to that practice rights email address, I can put out some feelers um, and, and see if I can get people in touch with, with someone. OK, I think that would be really helpful, Danielle, for members to have that kind of support. So thank you. Um, one question 
that's come through. In regards to the five years legal experience, does working as a legal secretary count towards this? So it would. Um, you're, you're being exposed to certain areas um, of law. Obviously, if you're looking at, if you say, years one to five with the five years, if years one to three are at secretary level, you might not have the same breadth of exposure that others who have been working at fee earner level um, for those five years will do. That's not necessarily an issue. It certainly wouldn't be a bar to you making the application, but you may find that you're asked more questions by the assessor. Um, if you're talking about year one and then the rest of it being fee earner level or, you know, a similar equivalent paralegal or whatever, um, it, it shouldn't be a problem. It's it's just to see that you've you've got your your grounding really. Uh, I think the practice rights scheme was built at a time where the rules of fellowship required five years qualifying employment, which has obviously been reduced to three. Um, and you used to have to have two years as a graduate member, where now you only have to have one. So I think that's where that five and two came from. Um, and with the fellowship criteria, legal secretary work was, was, was sufficient for qualifying employment. So in the same way it would be for practice rights. OK, that makes, makes sense. Um, so l leading off of that question then, still talking about the five years experience, do the five years need to be consecutive years? No, uh, so you can have breaks in the five years. Uh, you need to have five years of legal work. So it wouldn't be 2015 to 2020 if you took two years out in between. Then you'd be looking at sort of 2013 to 2020. Um, but we recognise that people have breaks uh, for various different reasons and, and it's not a problem. OK. Um... One question about, well, there's been a few questions actually about if if you got your law qualifications quite a few years ago, um, is that OK? Um, I don't believe there's any time barring, is there, to when when someone might have got, say, their qualifying law degree or completed their Silex studies, as long as they've done the right subjects for which they're seeking practice rights. Have I got that correct? That's right. Yeah, so um, the seven year rule that used to be around um, a few years ago obviously has, has gone um, and equally we don't require um, qualifications to be completed in a certain time. We have had applicants who did Silex level four exams that then obviously transitioned to level six and equally the old part twos for ILEX exams that then is equivalent to level six currently. Um, they all transition over, that's absolutely fine. So in terms of when you did your exams, don't worry too much. OK, um, there's one about the accounts knowledge, which uh, hopefully you can you can answer. Um, so the question is, you ask in the application form about accounts knowledge. So do we need to do part one and part portfolio to prove our accounts knowledge? So, as I say, um, as I covered in the presentation, the practice management and accounts is only needed if you're wanting to work in a Silex regulated firm, be that your own or just as an employee in one of our uh, of the Silex regulated firms. Depending on what qualifications you have will dictate whether you need to do a portfolio or not, is my understanding. Um, there is a Silex course for accounts that is dealt with by ILFM um, and they cover the, the the crux of level one assessment. So you can do that. And I understand from my colleague that if you do do that, there's a reduced requirement for a portfolio, if at all, depending on what else you've done. Um, so it really depends on your personal circumstances, what qualifications you've done in those areas as to whether you need to do the portfolio. And if you haven't done courses, the portfolio is your other option. I hope that answers that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it does. Um, so this is an interesting question um, from a, a member who 
Um, it's clearly ambitious. Um, so they would like to, uh, they work in civil litigation and conveyancing in the housing sector. Uh, could I gain practice rights for both at the same time or would I need to make one application or two? So technically it's two applications. Um, you will need to do two separate submissions. Um, the timing of when you submit those submissions is entirely your choice. Um, we tend to suggest staggering them just because it's quite full on, especially if you're, you know, managing full time job, your caseload and then doing one application is probably enough. But if you want to do two at the same time, you can. Um, you need to pay the two fees because you're being authorised in two areas and you'd need to do the application specific to the area that you're applying. So obviously two forms, two lots of portfolios, two lots of skills because where you're dealing with, was it civil and conveyancing, Louise? Um, so I'll just go back. Civil litigation and conveyancing in yeah. the housing sector. Yes. So obviously where you're dealing with um, your conveyancing application, you're going to be looking at different types of drafting, different types of negotiating to what you would be doing in a litigation setting. Um, so you will need to tailor both applications to the areas that you're seeking the rights. But if you want to send them in together, you can. And we do have at, um, practitioners with dual rights. So we've got uh, a lady um, who's authorised for conveyancing and probate, and we have two practitioners that are authorised for immigration and civil litigation. Wow. OK, it's nice to know that it's possible, isn't it? So <laughs> yeah, that's really encouraging. Uh, we've got a couple of questions about the DBS check. Um, so the first one is, do you contact the applicant to pay the DBS fee or the party paying for the application, for example, your employer? So the DBS application, the way that it works is um, we basically log into UCheck, we put in your name and your email address and we mark that you're going to pay for the check. Um, that then sends you through a link where you can access your application. Um, you fill in the relevant details, your name, your address, whatever it might be. Um, and then at the end of filling in that information, you're asked to provide card details to pay for that application. So I would assume that they would accept card details from an employer, um, but you, you deal with it yourself. So you can you can pay however you like with that one. OK, and if someone body already has an up to date full DBS check. Can they scan that to you so you don't need to do another one or do you have to do your own? We tend to say you need to do one for this application specifically. There's some technicalities around only being able to see a DBS that has been applied for a purpose that you're allowed to apply for a DBS. Um, so obviously that's to become an authorised person through Silex would be the reason. The other reason why I would err on the side of caution and say you need to do one specifically for this application is that there are three levels of DBS check um, and Silex regulation are only permitted to see basic and standard. So if you've done an enhanced check with your employer, that may contain information that wouldn't be um, disclosed on a standard check that once we've seen it we can't unsee it but we never should have seen it in the first place so probably the straight answer is um best to do it with your application okay um okay so moving on um if you have a silex level six exams in your practice area and in client care and legal research are you only required to complete the three portfolios and the completed application form? As well as the practice skills, yes. So you would do your completed application form, your three experience portfolios, and then for the skills section, you won't need to cover element one and two for client care and legal research, but anything after that for the skills requirements, you will need to do a logbook for. Okay. Um, so moving on, I passed my step qualification a few years ago to become a trust and estates practitioner. Can I use this in option two in part four skills rather than complete a logbook? 
so you can use courses to demonstrate skills um, so in theory you can attempt to i can't guarantee that it will absolutely pass every single thing you will what we suggest is you do a logbook sheet for each outcome and then you use the relevant part of your course as your evidence so it's a bit of a hybrid you end up with your logbook sheets discussing how the course developed your skills against the outcome um, but you don't need to go rifling through your caseload the same um, and our assessor will look at that and, and determine whether it's sufficient or whether they would like to see some evidence from the caseload. Okay um, I'm going to ask you this question Danielle but it might be a question for your colleague uh, because it's more business related but what type of indemnity or public liability insurance does a new practitioner require? <laughs> so um, there are specific insurance requirements um, that I am not particularly familiar with. There is some information on the Silex regulation website about insurance. If you want to have a look today, um, I can contact my colleague after this um, and ask for some, some brief wording and some information that we can send through with the Q&A answers um, to support as well. That's great. OK. Um, does the immediate uh, two years need to be full time employment? So I think we're going back to the experience. Um, is it is it like work based learning and qualifying employment where you need to be doing a number of hours uh, work of a wholly legal nature per week or is it not the same? Not the same, no. So you, fortunately not. Um, you can work part time and um, you can work full time. Again, obviously, we're looking at your experience um, and those points on uh, the, the relevant part of the application form. I think it's page four and um, we'll ask about the number of hours that you work in a week. It won't necessarily go against you working part time. Of course not. Um, but if you're working very small, um, a very small number of hours in a working week, you know, like 10 or 12 hours in a week, you may find it harder to do the application uh, it doesn't mean you can't be authorized it just might be more of a struggle you might end up finding that it takes you a bit longer to build up your caseload um, because of what you can manage in in a working week but if you're working sort of 24 hours a week and practice right it seems like the next best step certainly make an application there's no bar um, no requirement for you to be working full time Okay, so I think a couple of members had asked a similar question so hopefully we, we've answered that one um, what is a Silex regulated firm um, and are they the same as an SRA regulated firm? Now, obviously, they are both regulators, aren't they? But are there any key differences that you could explain? Um, yeah, I mean, the Solicitors Regulation Authority and Silex Regulation uh, are both uh, regulators of legal services um, and in terms of firm regulation, the approved regulator is actually Silex and Silex regulation provides the regulatory services to Silex for that. So a Silex regulated firm um, could offer conveyancing, probate, immigration or litigation services. Um, they need to be owned by um, an authorised person. So they're lawyer owned firms. Uh, we, we've recently received designation for alternative business structures, which slightly changes things. But in terms of Silex regulated entities, um, for, for the time being at least, um, they're lawyer owned. They have the same requirements to have professional indemnity insurance. They provide the services in the same way um, as a, a, an SRA regulated firm would do. Um, and solicitors own Silex regulated firms. You know, we, we've had some solicitors come to Silex wanting regulation by Silex as opposed to the SRA for, for whatever reason that might be. You know, there's always the, the ability of choice, which is something that that we've long been um, trying to lobby and get across is that, you know, you can choose your regulator. You're not tied to the SRA because you're a solicitor. Yeah, equally, you're not tied to Silex because you're a Silex member, but it tends to be that Silex members like to stay with Silex. And we're certainly seeing that more and more. Um, and there's some differences in terms of, you know, qualifying experience and um, the SRA require a certain level of post qualification experience, whereas Silex don't. 
Um, yeah, that, that's it, it's just the same. It's it's an equally creditable law firm. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, OK, um, this is this is one that might um, we've got one minute, so we'll see if we can get through this one. So please give me an example how to write a portfolio on experience section. Um, that's quite an open question, but um, is are you able to give a, a, a bit of a in a nutshell <laughs> example? Yeah, I mean, better than that, we do actually have an example, so we can send that around with the Q&A if, if that's all right with you. Um, really, um, the example shows what it needs to say. Um, it's a conveyancing example, so if you're not seeking conveyancing rights, obviously it's not going to show you the types of things that you might be able to rely on. But in terms of content, presentation, um, the level of explanation required is transferable. And unfortunately, at the moment, it's, it's the best that we've got. Um, as, as an alternative, if you want to look at the example, draft one of your cases and send it through to that practice rights email address, we can give you comments and feedback on one case as a draft. Um, that's probably better than me trying to, to give you um, all of that right now. <laughs> Well, that sounds like a good service. I think if I was going through this process, it would be nice to be able to send in a sort of a test example and see if I was on the right track. So that sounds like a good starting point to me. Well, that um, brings us to the end of our webinar today. So um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and hopefully um, Danielle has helped you to understand a bit more about um, practice rights and how you can start making your applications. Um, do contact her um, and her colleagues at Silex Regulation and also us at Silex if you would like some more support in making your application or, or any more encouragement because we're always able to give encouragement. And um, I'd just like to say thank you to Danielle for spending this time with us today to um, share her knowledge and experience on practice rights. Um, and I wish you all a, a fabulous weekend. Hopefully the weather will be nice for us. So goodbye for now. Thank you.